We're ready to go. We are live with Interchain Live. This is Ryan Munn. Thank you for joining us. And we have Jordan Gitterman here with us today from Item Bank. Uh, we were hoping to have uh, Virginia on, but a uh, little technical difficulty. So hopefully we'll get uh, some comments or questions in from her through you, uh, Jordan. But but uh, why don't we start off real quick with uh, you, a little bit of your background and you know what you're doing here. Sure. So I read about blockchain early on and Bitcoin and, and knew about that. But I was at the time quite busy. I was in the natural resources business, um, in the mining business at the time. And eventually I gravitated that I was in Chile, which uh, you and I have something in common in Chile. Yeah. I, I had a mine in Chile. And the whole time prior to it and while I was in Chile, but I was really um, very busy. You know, a mining project is very consuming, time consuming. No, wait, not crypto mining, right? This is for copper mining. Thank you for for uh, for bringing that up. So hard so, metal. Yeah, for hard hard assets. And so, you know, in dealing with the international banking system, it can be quite frustrating and expensive and also time consuming. So in watching a, a, a Bitcoin transaction take seconds usually, and in attempting to transfer money and it costing a lot of money and having to go through depending on what bank you're in, what country you're in, a different procedure each time. And, you know, it, it would be one thing if you paid the money and you got good service, but you got poor service, you had to wait a long time. And it just kept eating away at it, at me that I, I should be using Bitcoin and I, I wasn't. And so the whole time I was in Chile, uh, it was quite frustrating. And I also watched the value of Bitcoin, you know, send. And so when I came back to the States, I started going to different meetings, uh, Bitcoin meetings. And because I was, I was determined to get into the business, blockchain meetings, et cetera, et cetera. And so I realized that the direct peer to peer nature of the transactions is barter. And I was always a, a trader, but I never liked barter exchanges. It's a 50 year old business. And they're still 50 years old. So I, I, I had the idea of disrupting the barter business. And through the barter community, I was introduced to, to Virginia Robinson. So that's how I really got involved in the cryptocurrency space and how I was introduced to uh, Virginia and Item Bank. Awesome. Well, so since Virginia's not here, I'll ask you to uh, provide a little bit more intro for her. Um, so tell me a little bit about just kind of, you know, kind of what her, who she is, what her background, and then how you guys uh, met. Well, she's my partner. I have just so much respect for her. Uh, Virginia, early on, I think when she was about in her teens, uh, had a keen interest in currencies and watched numerous currencies fail and and watched how heartbreaking it is and early on was very determined to to learn as much as she she could about them and to figure out a way maybe to, to assist and to prevent from this these terrible things from happening when when a currency fails and her background is um, computer software and economics and also a trader she she was uh in the barter business for many years and so that's our background and she met up with uh, chris freeman he's also on our site and chris and oh is he uh he's an advisor yes he is okay um and chris is chris and, and her developed the basic human need concept of you know, delivering basic human needs to to communities. And Virginia, with her economic background, realized that you can cr create values, not create values, but come up with correct relative valuations, the, the best valuations, by using the products that are most necessary, which are basic human needs. And so 
they worked together uh, on the basic human needs, Chris and, and Virginia aspect of it, and she created a uh, evaluation system and at one point had Annette Riggs working with her. Annette Riggs is on the screen right now. Annette is, was head of uh, IRTA, which is the largest independent trade association uh, for direct trades. She was president of, the, of, of IRTA and worked for them for many years in many different capacities. So she's very well respected. And uh, Chris is just a intuitive uh, artist. He's just a uh, very, very compassionate, bright man. And so th they worked together for a period of time. And Virginia authored a book called Information Currency, The New Green, where uh, it takes a lot to summarize the book, but where so where, where she was pointing out that currencies offer incorrect information, and when they offer incorrect incorrect information, they also then offer incorrect valuations too. So that's um, right. So that's how how they got involved, and then uh, Virginia went and kind of proved out her. I kind of approved out theories uh, with building supply materials here in the, the United States that had no real value as far as you, you couldn't get their, their correct values for them here in the States. But she was taking those building supply materials, and this is in the 1990s, uh, late 90s, and bringing them to Jamaica, trading them for coffee. The Jamaicans were short of U.S. dollars. And she traded them for Jamaican coffee, which is a premium coffee here in the States, and brought the coffee back into the States and was able to realize full retail value for building supplies that were sitting there for a year or more. Hmm. And then she went as far as tracked the, the value and the, and the trades of building supplies in 20 different states with numerous uh, companies. I don't know how many building supply companies. And started to prove out the, the, the system that she developed, which is essentially item bank. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm, I'm running through, uh, the, the white, uh, is this the white? No, this is the, the pitch deck. Um, no, that's the white paper. This white paper. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, right now, uh, I won't spend too much time on it, but, but it, it's, it's got a, 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 a very, I think well-written outline of how, you know, how the, the system functions. Um, but let's just, this is the piece here. So basic human needs. So essentially let's just break this down for anybody watching that might, you know, be a little bit, um, you know, uh, unfamiliar with the concept or, or what it is that we're really doing is, you know, we're talking about how currently we base our valuations on either gold or on, uh, equations applied to gross domestic domestic product and debt calculations. Would that be? Fair enough to sort of summarize our current system. Um, yes, and that's, that's fair enough. Yes. Okay. So what we're trying to say is that really commodities should value currencies. So, and I, I can give a an interesting example using gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. So gold, one ounce of gold throughout history would always afford a man a really good pair of shoes and a nice suit. Yeah. And today, I don't know what gold's trading at today, but it's, it's, let's say it's $1,200 to $1,300. Right. That's and a pretty expensive, but you know, not, you know, you can find a suit that'll cost that much in a pair of shoes. <laughs> sure. It's not, but it's not outrageously priced for today. Right. But if, if it, you know, so what happened there? So the gold, one ounce of gold, equals a pair of shoes and a suit always. So why is it costs more dollars or whatever currency you're using today probably, why does it cost more to buy that? Are, are, did they go up in value? Did the, the shoes and the suits go up in value? Not really. They equal an ounce of gold. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, an ounce of gold. And vice versa, an ounce of gold always equals the, the, the shoes and the suit. That's kind of a constant value. Um, I'm sure you know it, it 
goes up and down a little bit, but right. not much. So probably you know, 100 years ago, it probably cost you 20 bucks, $20, right, to get a pair of shoes and a suit, you know. But why today does it cost 1300 So it's not the value of the of these products that went up. And so you know, to get correct valuations, you have to be able to, to point that out. And it's the price that went up. The price went up probably because in U.S. dollars, were, you know, so many more were printed and they were inflated. The supplies inflated. Right. It was, so really, it was really the value of the unit of account being applied that went down. I'm sorry. Say that again and hear you. The, the value of the unit of account that's being applied has gone yes. down. Exactly. Exactly. So we're using the most needed items to create value. And so here's here's another example. Imagine you woke up and you were you were naked and you were hungry and you had Bitcoin, gold and and cash. What would you do? I mean the chances are you would take those Bitcoin cash and and, and gold and exchange it for food and clothing and and shelter. Right. So, you know, those are the basic human needs. So we're taking basic human needs and developing a, a way to get them, first of all, to market by incentivizing producers to produce and by actually getting the correct valuations off of them. Excellent. Excellent. So there's five points here. It's the food, um, shelter, basic clothing, paper products, and then hygiene and emergency supplies. And those right. are all things that we have in stores all over, uh, not just in stores, but in storage, sort of in, you know, um, resources that, that, you know, in the U.S. are kept all over the place in order to have sort of emergency stores. But there's lots of places where we're undersupplied, which is why we have such a uh, bottleneck when there's a, a, a public emergency, you know, a hurricane or something along those lines. And... Yes. This problem isn't just the problem of those who don't have these basic needs, but it's a supply chain problem of supplying basic human needs um, where, you know, whenever necessary. It's true. It's also a lack of knowledge at times where there are traders, for example, that know that certain communities need products, but other people are unaware of it for whatever reasons. Sure. There's, you know, so... In a situation like that, where the idea is for us to um, publish in live time the trades of basic human needs. So if we were able to see a community that's paying much more money for an item, let's just say work boots, then producers of work boots would investigate bringing their work boots to this particular community. So having these relative values published and available to right to market, to find, well, to find markets to be served. Right. It allows the market to correct itself. And it's a free market. So people who are producing these items will want to profit from it. So they have all the incentive to go and bring these products to areas that don't have them. Excellent. Excellent. So uh so tell me about this. This is um Recent article that you wrote. Um, that was a, actually an interview. Somebody interviewed me. Oh, it was. Oh, okay. All right. Demi so, uh, Oh, right, right, right. So, um, yeah. So, so this is, um, you know, this is gaining traction. I want to talk a little bit about sort of the current uh, environment for impact entrepreneurship, and sure. and kind of where you see Item Bank going with uh, with its solutions. Okay, so um, you're obviously on a human humanitarian mission, but uh, but Item Bank is a, a business, right? Well, Item Bank is is absolutely a commercial endeavor. I think the last thing we need today is uh, an endeavor that can't sustain itself. So it's right. definitely a commercial endeavor. And so, in order to serve that. Um, you know how so so item bank you know one of the fundamental you know tenets is to really better value things so that you can better serve people 
uh, how does this serve businesses or what is the value proposition to, to businesses today and, and moving forward? So I, if you're a producer of goods, and let's just go to the example of uh, in Jamaica, they didn't have actual cash when Virginia wanted to get them the building supplies. They, they really needed building supply materials. So they needed doors and they needed other supplies. But they, Jamaicans were short of cash, short of dollars. So it's an opportunity for producers to have another avenue to move their products. So we're considering starting off from Rwanda. Um, and much of Africa falls into this category where the, the people don't have cash, but they have production. They are productive, they are producing, and so it incentivizes producers to produce and produce the products that humans need most, the, the basic human needs, and you just mentioned the five categories of them. Mm -hmm. So it really incentivizes producers to bring their products to, to market and gives them an opportunity to, what we're doing is opening up a, a BHN warehouse for producers to bring their basic human need products in and they stake them to our warehouse, our retail warehouse. Again, we call it a BHN. And for bringing their products there, they get a credit in the warehouse in the BHN and the credit is in the form of a cryptocurrency. So now producers can exchange their products let's just use the example of work boots again so you have a manufacturer of work boots and can let's say they're in africa and they they can produce more work boots but you know it's a problem with cash a lot of africans let's say don't have cash to buy them right but they do have other things that they're producing and that if you brought them to our to, our, to the bhn so they bring work boots there they get a credit there they can exchange it for other items and then or they can get the the cryptocurrency and they can exchange it at a later date or they could trade it for whatever they want whoever would accept it we believe that there'll be liquidity in our currency because it's redeemable for basic human needs so if you're a, a merchant in the area and people said look i don't have cash I'll, i have item banks cryptocurrency a merchant might take some of that currency they probably i think they would because they know they can go in there and they can buy things that they're using anyway so they might as well move some of their products and they can go in and they can buy you know their toilet paper and their work boots as i mentioned and yep. you know different types of of uh, medical supplies and stuff like that excellent <laughs> And all the data would also provide uh, location benefits in terms of um, efficiently sourcing and identifying resource opportunities to produce items in, in more sort of efficient or sustainable uh, locations. Correct. So as these trades are, are done through the BHN and using uh, the cryptocurrency, by smart contract, the information is retrieved and it's run through our engine and the, the item bank engine will will use you know price as a big indicator of what it was ex exchanged for um, the, and you can couple that with economic calculations like purchasing power parity which is the major economic calculation that will be used amongst others and artificial intelligence that you can get the best relative valuations and so yes and that 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 is published again and the market can then you know use that information to make intelligent decisions do we produce more work boots do we maybe realize that whatever currency we have in that area fiat currency is losing value maybe we should get out of that currency you know there's all different different things that we'll be able to um to demonstrate with relative valuations. Yeah, excellent. So tell me this uh, analogy here of, uh, you know, say a storm happens, say uh, there's a... So if a, uh, if a storm happens, 
give you one second. If a storm happens and there's, let's say there's a numerous, um, numerous uh, destruction and there's lots of things that we know are going to be needed, right? These people probably need water. They'll need certain things. But there are items that we don't know that they'll need. Let's just say it's it's blue jeans because I see blue jeans on the screen. Yeah. Well, because commodities go, they're very sensitive to supply and demand, and they're, they're very price sensitive. And what we're doing is really commoditizing by making their information known, their values known. We're commoditizing basic human needs, so the price of blue jeans will go up. It will go up very quickly in the area that needs them this information is published will immediately be able to see hey wait a second there's a problem these guys need need blue jeans and the market will take care of itself for the most part or let's say it's an agency that wants to help and let's for this particular example use i don't know the red cross the red cross would have that information it would say wow we got to get blue jeans there immediately and get blue jeans to them but it could be any item it could be peroxide it could be bandages it could be Whatever it is, uh, those those items will be very, very price sensitive, um, very supply and demand rather uh, are sensitive, and the price will be will go up very quickly or go down quickly. And right now, I don't think there's anything that's publishing this information in real time. And so, the information is so valuable. I mean, right, it can help in so many different ways. Yeah, interesting. And so. I mean, this really creates, in theory, a uh, you know, it really a, a, a capital model, capitalistic model of of supporting the market in a dynamic way, so that it's responsive to. Because we, in in reality, we have predictive models that tell us there's a storm coming. So as soon as the information starts leading that way, um, the prices can be reacting, and how that information is handled can determine, you know, how much volatility actually uh, manifests in the market when there's a upset like that. Sure. Absolutely. And, you know, it will, it will show, it just will show really what, what the real value is in, in particular markets and it will allow the market to remedy itself by bringing, by bringing more of these different items there or if you're a manufacturer and you see the pricing plummeting, is there's one of two things going on. Either either your currency is going so so much up, right, that that the, that that it's worth more, so that the price is going down actually, or there's an oversupply of of, of this item. And so if you're a manufacturer, you can make your adjustments. You can say, well, maybe we should we shouldn't manufacture as much here, or we should start looking to export elsewhere or well, we have too much of this local currency and it's a problem with it it's, it's gotten stronger and we should move it and and buy items with it while it's stronger or you know you'll be able to make intelligent decisions with really having an information information currency which is what one of the things we call our our right. currency right. an information currency because behind it and backing it up is this information yeah, it's uh, it's excellent. So, so tell me what what um what do you guys have going on right now as far as any partnerships that you can talk about or um, uh, opportunities to to collaborate on on implementing this. So, rephrase that. Who are we collaborating with at the moment? Yes. Yep. That you can talk about. I don't know what's public or not public. Um. So yeah, we're, we're really just starting to set up partnerships. We're talking to the One Acre uh, Fund. One Acre Fund is 500,000 small farmers in Africa. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned okay. earlier, we're, we're looking to start in Africa. Uh, so we went to, to Rwanda, where we're looking to start. Mm -hmm. Rwanda, um, we chose for several reasons. Uh, one of them is part of our, some of our team members are are from Rwanda and have worked in the, previously in the government of Rwanda. Um, so we have some support in, in those circles there. We met with the Ministry of Trade of, of Rwanda and were very well received. So it's a small country. 
and we have support there. It's now rated as the ninth safest country in the world. They emulated Singapore's law. They're rated by, I think, the Heritage Foundation as a 23rd uh, most economically free area. So there's a lot of reasons why we want to start in Rwanda. It's also in the, in the middle of Africa, so to speak. And so that's where we're looking to start. We, we also spoke recently to an investor who wants us to, if, he, if we do something together, to open up here in the States. Uh, they're discussing Texas with us. And if we were to open up here in the States, we'd, we'd probably want to do it in South Carolina by the, a port that we're familiar with. So those are some of the things that we're, we're working on. Um, there's uh, Smart Africa, which is a, a consortium of every African nation um, that we're, is somewhat supportive of us. Um, there's a company, Dadium, which we're going to sign a collaboration agreement with. Uh, Kasha. I don't know if you heard of Kasha, but Kasha is um, yeah. the largest um, ICO of the fourth quarter of 2017. And they've become a uh, crypto banking um, team out of the UK. Um, and we're working with numerous other companies that we're starting to to gel with. Uh, we just got the phone with a, a gentleman named Paul Walsh, who's helped us along. He has a, com a company called Greenheart. Greenheart is uh, an application that brings uh, live food to the table from or, from small organic farmers. And so Paul and I had we just had a great conversation on how to integrate this application into what we're doing. Uh, we're we're not big on uh, foods that don't have a long shelf life for, for reasons because it's a big responsibility. But perhaps we can we can. Uh, do better with his app, his application. Yeah. So very, I mean, just we're very well received by the by the community. The market now is a little bit slow, as you know, with Bitcoin having its volatility problems, uh, holidays coming in, and so on and so forth. So we're just uh, taking our time, setting up um, our our collaborative eco economic system, you know, with different different companies. And it's going pretty well, and uh, we're moving slowly but steadily. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, sounds great. In fact, I'm thinking of a couple of names I should, maybe I'll just drop them right here. Uh, ScanTrust is a company that I met recently mm -hmm. that um, does, uh, did, did I mention them to you before? They, no. uh, they do um, supply chain, food, food, uh, food supply chain uh, sure. services, right? And they, they've been in business for a number of years. They began implementing blockchain uh, not too long ago, I believe maybe three years ago, maybe even six. Uh, I can't remember what they had told me. But essentially, as they've done that, they've had a few clients kind of disappear, sort of fall off the radar. Um, <laughs> but uh, but they one of the things that they're doing is um, they're also um, collaborating, I guess, with this project called Good Chain, which is basically a pr pretty simple uh, uh, initiative to create a, a label that can be scanned on the end product so that it shows if there's any kind of claim of a donation to charity as part of the product, this will basically good chain will provide the donation to charity side of that, uh, optionality for the, the merchant and the transparency for the consumer to actually see that their transaction, uh, was actually like 10% of it donated to whatever charity it is and uh, potentially go further into even working with the charities to provide deeper accounting transparency with them. Uh, at least that's my understanding of the initiative, but it, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, very worthwhile initiative that they're doing and they've got real, you know, real world experience in a business model being applied using blockchain today. And there's no question that it's adding value to their service. It's pretty cool. Yeah, wow. yeah. So I'd encourage you, I met those guys, uh, Tim, Tim uh, uh, Hansel. Uh, came to visit over in, in Vermont here, and that's what I'm sure. Know. I'd love to to look at the um, the project and see maybe do some synergies there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, well, great. I think we should wrap it up so that our viewers don't get too fatigued. I'm sure we could go on for hours at this point. We've definitely got a lot of uh, a lot of interesting oh, things yeah. that this stuff touches on, and uh, and it's just it's so interesting, you know, how you know the concept you're talking about really does permeate so many different areas. And, you know, even, you know, we started talking about like healthcare and wellness and, 
you know, how do we handle, uh, you know, energy and, 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 and climate change? Well, that comes down to land stewardship. And then that comes down to, you know, appropriately valuing the stewardship of that land and the results of that stewardship being a byproduct that is food, you know, all these different things come together. And uh, I'm just really excited to see where it goes with item bank and uh, what you guys do with it. So it's, uh, it's exciting times, but you know, we, we have the feeling is our feeling is the following is that all these technologies are coming out now and they're terrific, but what good are they if we can't get people their basic human needs? And so that's, you know, the first step we believe into the acceptance of these technologies not everywhere, but certainly in much of Africa and much of Latin America, as we were talking about it earlier. I mean, there's real issues and problems. People really need basic human needs. And we, you know, we're, we're hoping that we can go to all these different communities, every community that needs basic human needs and incentivize their communities to produce them. And also with that market information that we'll have, the relative valuations, be able to get them uh, fair at fair prices, basic human needs from wherever it may be, and deliver them to market. And in doing so, also uh, get the correct valuations off of basic human needs, which you've commoditized and made their value known uh, in real time. So that's that's what really what we'd love to do, and just go to every community that will accept us, that wants us, that that needs us and there's plenty that do and just keep keep doing it so awesome well thanks for doing the hard work stick with it and I thank you it, for joining us here on interchain live it's been a pleasure thank you very much for having us awesome thank you